Hello, and welcome to the Dissidents Podcast, where we talk about how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are at the forefront of all human society. In this week's podcast, my co-host, Winfield Twyman Jr., and I speak with author Matt Johnson on his new book, How Hitchens Can Save the Left, Rediscovering Fearless Liberalism in an Age of Counter-Enlightenment. We discuss themes in his book, including Hitchens' staunch adherence to liberalism, his defense of the freedom of speech, dismissal of identitarianism, and the ways extremism have affected how we operate today and what we can do using Hitchens as a model to reverse damaging trends. Join us. Matt Johnson, welcome to the Counterweight Podcast. It is awesome to have you here. You are also with my co-host, Winkfield Twyman Jr., which Wink is so great to see you too because you know we, we're not always the co-hosts together. But Matt, we were so excited to do this Wink and I together for several reasons. First of all, we're fascinated with your book, which for our listeners is How Hitchens Can Save the Left, Rediscovering Fearless Liberalism in an Age of Counter-Enlightenment. And a lot of it, you know, Wink and I are, are, have written on some themes that aren't the same, but 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 similar. And also, when I read, hear more about what you're writing about in the book, it's so much a foundation of what counterweight is in general, which is this counterweight, if you will, truly a counterweight between extremes. So we talk about the left and we talk about the right. And one of your things that you talk about in this book is how um, the left has given rise to the right and vice versa. And it's just like this like perfect mess. But before we get into that, I have to tell you, I'm very embarrassed. Um, Wink does not share my embarrassment because he's more enlightened than me. But I honestly didn't know about Christopher Hitchens until I read about him through you. So my first two questions for you are, a, you know, for those of us who are like me, who are ignorant on who Hitchens is, who is Hitchens? And then I guess the second question that you can just kind of go right in there into is why did Hitchens uh, create such an influence on you that it ended up in a book? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, that's nice to hear because a lot of the people who might be interested in the book almost certainly uh, know plenty about Hitchens and have read a lot of Hitchens. And uh, I often say that one of the pitfalls of writing about Hitchens is that he is so much better of a writer and so much more eloquent than I could ever be. So, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a, a walking advertisement against your, your own work. You know, I, I would recommend that just about anyone go straight to his work and, you know, it, 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 in interpreting Hitchens and trying to analyze what he actually thought is almost a fool's errand because he, you know, he just expressed it so well. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say, you should you should check out Hitchens' stuff itself and uh, maybe then, then come back around to the book. But um, Hitchens was an Anglo-American author and journalist. Uh, he, he died in 2011. Um, he, his career arc sort of just traced several very important periods uh, in American political history. So he moved to the United States in the early 1980s. Um, he was an, uh, a columnist for The Nation, which is a far-left magazine that's uh, probably become even more far left in recent years, but uh, it, it, he, he was a socialist. He was a, a stern critic of U.S. foreign policy. Um, he's, he's always had a, a very deep grasp of Anglo-American letters and literature, and he's, he's an essayist who's, who's written about, you know, everything from, from Dickens to Kissinger for, for a very long time. Um, and he, he had what many of his critics regard as a political shift after the September 11th attacks. And one of the core themes of my book is that that shift uh, is sort of imaginary. I mean, he was already coming to many of the conclusions that, that he came to uh, in the 21st century throughout the 90s and, and maybe even earlier. Um, he was starting to value liberal democracy and the defense of liberal democracy as a sort of end in itself. He wasn't filtering it through the ideological prism of democratic socialism, which he had done in, in the years prior. Um, he was becoming more of an interventionist, um, which was an extension of his internationalism. So during the conflict in the Balkans, uh, he supported uh, the NATO campaign um, to to uh, force Milosevic to um, concede and, and Dayton and, and, you know, and stop just ripping through Bosnia and then the same, the same thing in, in Kosovo. And so these these 
position sort of like set him up for his post 9-11 positions, which included the support for the invasion of Afghanistan and, and Iraq, which are his most controversial positions. And we can kind of get into why he supported those wars, how they were extensions of his, his core principles. Um, and he was also, he was also uh, a real liberal. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, he's so relevant to people who might be interested in counterweight and, and its mission. Um, he had absolutely no patience for identitarianism of any kind. He, he just hated tribalism across the board, whether it was uh, religious dogma or nationalism um, or the authoritarianism that can stem from, from all of those different forms of, of sort of tribal identification. And I, he was consistent on those points all the way through. I mean, from when he was a socialist uh, writing for the nation, from when he was, you know, writing for the new statesman in, in Britain in the 70s. Um, so th- those, are, those are a few of the characteristics of his life that I think have remained very pressing and very relevant today. I have a question, Matt, uh, that occurred to me. Um, yeah. You mentioned that um, he was a real liberal. Uh, which I agree with. I think that's a good assessment of Hitchens. Um, I've always wondered, however, maybe you can explain for me, in the year 2023, is there a bright line distinction or not between real liberals and the left? Or is there overlap? How does that work today in the year 2023? And how would Hitchens perceive any lingering distinction between the two? Um, yeah, there's certainly an overlap between the two. I mean, being there are a lot of liberals on the left and liberals on the right, and that's that's one theme mm-hmm. of the book. And uh, what I'm what I'm trying to recapture in the book is a left wing tradition that Hitchens held to until the end of his life. Uh, I argue that Hitchens was always on the left. This isn't to say that he didn't have any fundamental shifts of perspective, that he didn't change his mind on important issues, because he certainly did. I mean, you you just can't square. Um, his vociferous opposition to the Gulf War with his support for the Iraq War, for example. I mean, there, there was definitely a shift there. And I do think Hitchens sometimes downplayed the fact that there was a shift. But when it came to his core principles, uh, like internationalism, like this anti-identitarianism, his support for free expression in just about every conceivable scenario, um, it, it harkens back to, you know, Eugene V. Debs fighting for free speech during World War I, to the Berkeley free speech movement, um, to Orwell's anti-totalitarianism and, and staunch support of free speech. It, it, it's just, it's a left-wing tradition that I think is sort of getting lost in the cacophony now, because identity politics really has risen as a force on the left. I mean, I, I remember vividly in, um, during the 2020 primary, when Bernie Sanders said, you know, we have to look at candidates on the basis of, of their uh, principles and positions, and we shouldn't look at their age or their gender or their race, you know, and he, he was just destroyed for this point. Like, he just, he just got ripped to shreds for it. And that, that is something that would have been very intelligible to very radical people just a few mm-hmm. decades ago. You know, Bayard Rustin, for example, who Hitchens was a huge fan of and who Hitchens regarded as a, a real liberal. You know, like the idea that it, we, we absolutely have to focus on, you know, physical traits and on melanin and on you know, genitalia instead of ideas and principles it was very, very foreign to a socialist like Hitchens, who was always such a universalist, you know, who, who believed human beings should look upon other human beings as human beings and assess their principles and positions on that basis. So, yeah, I, there are still people on the left who believe that. Um, there are even people I disagree with pretty intensely on matters of foreign policy who agree with me on uh, free speech and on identity politics. Ben Burgess wrote a book about Christopher Hitchens. Uh, it came out last year, early last year, I believe, in January. Um, yeah, we, we don't share many political principles, but I do think that he shares um, Hitchens' attitude toward identitarianism, for example, mm-hmm. or toward, uh, you know, having, having the argument, like he has a book called, like, give them an argument about like how the left shouldn't shy away from, from right-wing critics and we shouldn't try to deplatform people. We shouldn't, you know, try to Twitter mob people. We should engage with them. So I do think that's a, that's definitely a real trend on the left and we just have to build it up as much as possible. Does, does the left want to be saved, Matt? That's a good question. Actually, uh, Nick Cohen <laughs> is about to write a two part essay, I suppose on the, on the, well, I mean, I guess he's using the Hitchens book as my Hitchens book as sort of a jumping off point 
Um, but he's just going to discuss like how Hitchens remains relevant today, you know, what Hitchens got wrong. And he actually asks on, on his sub stack at the very beginning of this little series, he says, I'm, I'm afraid that the left doesn't want to be saved. That's my fear. He asks whether or not the left wants to be saved. And I, I think there are definitely large swathes of the left that do not want to be <laughs> saved, unfortunately. I mean, there are too, too many people who are too invested in racial grievance mongering, for example. There are too many people who believe you know, deplatforming and, and, and silencing people is radical. It's a revolutionary position. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was in Seattle briefly, and there, I went to some bar, and I was just playing pool with friends, and there's there some, like, there's some anti-fascist graffiti scrawled on the on the the wall next to the pool table, and I just remembered making a joke like, you know, these people think they're storming the beaches of Seattle, <laughs> you know, when they when they act like we're, we're just inundated with fascists in the Pacific Northwest, and there's just like I don't know how you can really hear a view like that because it's so sanctimonious and it's so it's so just like self-regarding, you know. So I do think there's a strong element of that on the left today. And then, you know, I don't know if we'll get into foreign policy, because I, I think it might sort of be outside the scope of our conversation today. But I do think there's a very strong investment in what would be regarded as the anti-imperialist mm. left today. Mm. Um, that's what they call themselves anyway. Okay. And these are the sorts of people who uh, see a Russian dictator invade his neighbor um, and engage in the most naked example of imperial violence that we've seen in a very, very long time and immediately decry NATO and immediately blame NATO and say, this is because we expanded up into Putin's backyard. And this is because, you know, the United States has had it all its own way since the end of the cold war. And this is just our comeuppance. And, you know, we're the real imperialists. And that's the sort of thing that Hitchens would have had absolutely no mm -hmm. patience for. So when, when the war broke out in Ukraine, I, I immediately thought, well, that is at least one issue in the book that will resurface as entirely yeah. relevant because you know I've, I've been talking about and writing about foreign policy for so long and it ebbs and flows i mean people are often not interested in the subject especially in american politics so uh yeah that's that's another area where the left is very invested in a narrative and they regard it as anti-imperialism and i think that's been a mistake for about three decades but you know and i want to i do want to get into that um in a minute because that's where you know, in, in defense of my ignorance, you know, my whole background is in China relations, China studies, international relations. Don't talk about and the so balloon. I haven't paid. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. No, no, we're oh, not yeah, talking about the balloon. <laughs> that's, that's another topic. Yeah. The, the, great, the great geopolitical <laughs> crisis of our day. It's a very whimsical political crisis. Oh my gosh. It's... You know, I, I actually told a friend recently, like I'm, I'm, I was half expecting, I guess Blinken's not going to China now, but I was half expecting him to, you know, G to like, shake his hand with one of those joke carvers <laughs> on his hand and like put a whoopee cushion under his seat or something i was just like what what is going on <laughs> oh my gosh yeah uh i'm still looking into that one so much to be unraveled there but before we do get to foreign policy and i hope we do because again that's really where i've spent my life and where my focus is and so these ideas mm -hmm. around imperialism and internationalization globalization are are, are important to me but I want to go first to this idea that you bring up because we've been talking we've been using the word the left, the left, the left, talking about that, criticizing this. And, and this is one of the problems that I see uh, and I see in, with counterweight, too, that we are trying to deal with extremism regardless of where it comes from. And you bring up even that this kind of new leftist take has actually energized a new extremism on the right too. So let's talk a little bit about that and what you have see happening with um, the right, the left and the interplay in that conversation. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's probably one of the most important features of the book. And I do think it's something that is, I, you know, I, I don't think counterweight wants to talk in terms of sides and what side you're on, but our side, you know, if you want, if you want to call people heterodox left wingers or heterodox liberals or just liberals, we need to, I, I do think there's a lot of, there's a lot of false equivalency that, that floats around. Um, and it's, it's very, it's very easy when you, when you are invested in criticizing the left, as I have been for a long time now, because I actually do consider myself on the left. I'm sure there are a lot of people who'd say, oh no, you're just like a baby neocon mm -hmm. or something. But I mean, I, I really, that's how I think of myself. And I, I've always thought of myself that way. Actually, when I worked uh, at a newspaper in, in Kansas, 
you know, I, I got phone calls from our readers. They called me a communist. They said I was, I was supporting Medicare expansion in the state. And I, you know, I supported, I was very opposed to Chris Kobach, who's our secretary of state. And he was, you know, he was actually on Trump's voter fraud commission. I don't know if you remember that, but that was just like, like it was a gravy train for writers in Kansas for a long time. Sam Brownback's tax experiment, disaster. You know, these were, these are all, these were left-wing positions by my lights. Um, but now, now I'm considered sort of right wing because I, you know, say that Ukraine has a right to defend itself. Anyway, I think it's bizarre, but yeah, I mean, the, the gravest threat, uh, to liberal democracy on the planet today, I would say is populist authoritarianism on the right. I, I still think that it's, it's probably the most concrete threat that we face. And, uh, Hitchens didn't talk about Trump, you know, I mean, Trump wasn't, mm -hmm. he wasn't on the political scene at, at the time. He actually didn't really like Trump really became politically active as we know him now, right after Hitchens died, he's always been political and he's always done interviews and talked about, I think the one position that was consistent for Trump over the years was like his protectionism and was his, you know, his hostility to NATO and to the U S led alliances in the world. Uh, but yeah, Trump really started talking about Obama's birth certificate and, you know, his, whether or not he was born in the country, you know, this is like kind of right after Hitchens, but Hitchens was very critical of uh, Sarah Palin, for, for bringing up, raising questions about uh, Obama's um, citizenship. And like he, he, he could, you know, George Packer described Sarah Palin as the, the John the Baptist to the coming of Trump. And I think he was quite right about that. And, and Hitchens was really hostile to the elements on the right, you know, the sort of Glenn Beckification of the right, where, where it, it wasn't just like tax policy anymore. You know, the Tea Party wasn't just about smaller government. The, the Tea Party wasn't just about, like there was this, this element of ugly populism and anti-democratic sentiment that was creeping into the right. Um, and then those things just came you know, into full view with, with Trump, of course. But yeah, Hitchens could see that there was this weird self-pity on the right and this, this weird sort of identitarianism that was emerging among uh, largely white, <laughs> older Americans uh, who, who just didn't like the, the changing nature of the country. And I, I just really do think, and I don't want to speak for the dead, and I have no right to, but I do think that Hitchens would have seen Trump for what he was. I think he would have seen that phenomenon as truly dangerous and truly frightening. And uh, he also just would have hated Trump's views on foreign policy. I mean, I can almost tell you with as close to certainty as I can muster that that's the case. But anyway, I just I think Hitchens actually had a good record of anticipating the emergence of the, the populist right. And he actually said something like the way in which... Um, Islam was being demagogued in Europe and the way in which uh, right-wing demagogues were using Islam as the sort of cudgel uh, to try to pass uh, anti-liberal and, and um, anti-democratic policies. He's like, I'd be very surprised if this phenomenon didn't make its way across the pond to the United States. Mm. And he said that uh, a couple of years before he died. And I just have to say that he predicted it with perfect acuity. I mean, Trump showed up in office. People forget that during the campaign in 2015, I mean, it was it was all about the threat posed by by Islam. I mean, that, that's what Trump talked about day in, day out. And he said he was going to ban Muslims from the country. I mean, don't let anyone tell you that his his ultimate ban was just like, oh, it was focused on these mm -hmm. countries. And it was really just about security. He explicitly told us he wanted to ban Muslims from the country. So, yeah, I think Hitchens saw that coming. And, and I think the rights of liberalism just needs to be called out relentlessly uh, for, for liberals to be consistent. So, uh, yeah, I. I tried to do that in the book. I, I hope I succeed. And I do think that the things we were talking about on the left fuel the right big time. I mean, you know, the 1776 commission, uh, everything that Trump was trying to do around education and around uh, sort of like cultural grievance gathering. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the 1776 uh, uh, entity. How do you think Christopher Hitchens would have perceived the 1619 project? Uh, it's so hard. It's it's really hard to say. I actually think, and again, I, I just always have to qualify the, the speculation with, I really do try to be careful not to put words in his mouth. And, you know, I, he was a very unpredictable guy. And, and so, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I actually think he would have been more sympathetic to the 1619 Project than many people who I agree with now. Uh, many people who I think are, are of sound mind on identity politics in the United States and on, on racial conflict in the United States are very critical of uh, the 1619 Project. I don't think he would have been as critical as like a John McWhorter or something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, he probably would, I, yeah, I just, because do you, do you remember the, do you, I don't know if you've read any of the book or um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I sent a copy to you guys or if you really know about, like, the chapter two is about identity politics in general and about Hitchens' sort of uh, history on, on, like, questions of race in the United States. But he he engaged in a debate in, I think, the year 2000. So this is a pretty late stage Hitchens. You know, this is right before his supposed mm-hmm. political shift in 2001. Um, but it was about reparations. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he came down very firmly in favor of reparations. Interesting. In this debate. And actually, Glenn Lowry was on the, he's on the panel. And so he was debating against Glenn Lowry, which is, it's a really interesting kind of clash that mm-hmm. you can see. And he, it's, it's kind of remarkable because he does, he, even though he's disagreeing with him uh, pretty vehemently, he, he credits Glenn Lowry with delivering a, a really like dignified and passionate and uh, powerful address. And, you know, he says, like, I understand what you're saying when you say you can't buy me off with reparations <laughs> like this. This is a matter of, of pride and personal dignity. And Hitchens is like, I totally get that. But then he says, you can only say that for yourself. And there are many people in the country who would disagree with you. And you can't speak for all those people. So that's Hitchens' core argument. But yeah, he, I, I just think he was really quite radical when it came to like the ways in which we could address the structural factors that have led to inequality today and that drive you know different racial outcomes. So I, with the 1619 Project, I don't know, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually do have to... There, there are elements of identitarianism that I think he would have called out. I mean, he always, he always criticized people for, quote, thinking with the blood or um, people who say speaking as a and then mm-hmm. making a point like he just didn't like it. He just thought you could couch all of these arguments in universal yeah. principles and arguments that could be intelligible. You know anyone. what I miss? So, I, yeah. This you is, know what I miss, Matt, sure. uh, from the 2000s? You were summarizing that exchange between Hitchens and Glenn Lowry. It sounds like it was a civil discourse. They disagreed, but there was no sense of being disagreeable or counseling or ignoring or dismissing. How do we lose that? How do we lose that wisdom, the ability to disagree, but not be disagreeable? Why did that go away? Yeah, it's, I don't know. I, it's, it certainly seems, I mean, you know, I could I could give you all the sort of standard responses about social media and how it's affected our attention spans and provided bad incentives, and I think a lot of those things are true for sure. Um, and I will also say that Hitchens, for all his genteel civility, was also quite ferocious. Yes, when yes, he, he was. <laughs> he wasn't always. He, he definitely wasn't always the most. Uh, he wasn't always the most polite interlocutor. This um, is true. And you just have to just look at just look at a history of Hitchens one-liners <laughs> and debates, and you'll see a, a man who could be pretty savage. I did a Google stage. check, but that I do one. think I think the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the reason he could be civil with uh, Glenn Lowry is because Glenn, Glenn Lowry is kind of a he's kind of a powerhouse. I mean, he's a tour yeah. de force. You know, the guy's just he just kind of commands respect yeah. on the stage. Yeah. So I just think yeah, Hitchens. Real recognize real kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I don't know. It is depressing that conversations like this, like there's, it's tough to find people who are willing to approach these things on on a, a common sort of a common right. ground of mm-hmm. of a, a civil understanding that like I you know the the things that I say in the book, I guarantee you there are a lot of people in the world who who will say, oh, that's a uh, that's imperialistic or that's you know, fascist. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those it's words so, that just gets thrown around so it's much. It's so disappointing, now. Matt. And I, I, I really, I, I agree with you. It's really devastating. Like I said, storming the beaches of Portland, storming the beaches of Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I mean, people who say Christina Huff Summers is a fascist. I mean, that's what she was when she was shouted down at was it Oberlin? Sure. I mean, one of these liberal arts schools. You know, like no platform for fascists. Right. Right. They said. Like the left, the left used to be like George Orwell fighting fascists in Spain. Yeah. I mean, what happened to yeah. that? Yeah. Like, it's it's so it's such a misconstruction. I'll give you a great. So, I don't know where it went. I'm probably not the man to diagnose. I'll give you a great before. example of what I mean. Um, so, Christopher Hitchens, <clears throat> I applaud him and admire him as a man of conscience, a man who spoke his mind, an independent thinker, uh, someone who embodied the best in free expression. I think that's great, and that makes my heart beat faster. It doesn't mean I agree with everything he said. Two points come to mind. One, I think he had a very low opinion of Reverend Billy Billy Graham, and in my household, Reverend Billy Graham was esteemed. He was seen as a, a great spiritual leader, a great Christian leader. But that's cool. It doesn't prevent me from admiring all the other great things about Christopher Hitchens. Number two, 
from what I gather, Christopher Hitchens was not a great fan of science fiction. I love Star Trek, <laughs> and I guess Christopher oh, Hitchens was not a Trekkie. <laughs> but once again, it's a minor thing that doesn't take away from my ability to really embrace and applaud the greater man. It's discernment, Matt. I think it's the loss of discernment, the ability to recognize that everyone mm -hmm. is nuanced and complex. And someone can be a great intellectual and have some imperfections you may take exception to. But it doesn't lessen your appreciation for the overall contribution of the man. And I guess that's what I, I'll admit, is that loss of discernment in the public square. Yeah, and he was, um, you know, Hitchens was probably the biggest Orwell fan ever. And that's saying a lot because Orwell has a lot of fans. I mean, yeah. but he had like, in his apartment, he had like the collected works of Orwell and he was interviewed about it once. And he said like, including his expenses reports to the BBC, he was like, a lot, <laughs> I have them all. But Orwell was just a, a deeply flawed person. You know, he never really quite got over his homophobia. Yeah. I mean, he, he was, Orwell got a lot of things quite wrong, but I mean, it's just like it, the, the way Hitchens put it was, he was a writer who was always wrestling with his own prejudices and, and ultimately mm -hmm. prevailed in the end. And like, that's, that's a powerful assessment of a man. And I just, yeah, there's, there's that sort of nuances is long gone. And it's, it's sad. I actually wrote an essay for Quillette a while ago about um, Orwell and Henry Miller. Mm. I was trying to compare the two. You can, you can be the judge of whether I successfully did so. <laughs> But I, I do think that like the commonality between the two is that they, they did just confront the ugliness in their own character. You know, I mean, or Orwell um, wrote in, in one of his most like, you know, self, I suppose, self-effacing essays, you know, that he, he really hated British imperialism in India and he considered himself a political opponent of imperialism. But he said when he was a colonial policeman, a policeman that sometimes he thought the, the greatest joy in the world would be to stab his bayonet into a Buddhist priest's stomach, you know? I mean, this is like an admission that's truly sure. horrifying. Like, mm -hmm. I, God, if I ever had that thought, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sure. put it into words on the page. <laughs> right. And, you know, Henry Miller was the same way. He just kind of talked about how he just felt sometimes like this amoral monster, you know, who just didn't care about anything. Sheer nihilism, you know? And he has page after page in, like, Tropic of Cancer where he just admits to this stuff. You know, and it's these are these are really ugly, ugly sentiments that people reveal about themselves to show the world that like, yeah, you know, you, the, the dark side of the human nature is quite dark. But nowadays, I mean, God, if Orwell wrote what, what if somebody wrote that in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. I mean, they would be canceled mm -hmm. immediately and almost almost for good reason. I mean, that truly really yeah. is horrifying, you know, but it's just like, yeah, we're so far from that where with that level of nuance and, and self-criticism is it's not it's not even possible. Not even you know? possible. I wonder sometimes, and yeah. Jen and I have talked about this, Matt, could it be that this current culture, this current generation, is kind of setting the stage for its own destruction? Because if you think about it, you know, the kids who are now age zero through 20, they're coming of age in classrooms, under teachers, and woke parents, and woke uh, administrators. Aren't they going to feel a need for um, something more than dogma, something more than black and white thinking, something more than blackness is oppression, nothing else matters, uh, as I've heard someone say in, in my family? I mean, could it be that the children of this generational culture today will turn the wheel back to a time where we once again can appreciate nuance and complexity? Because they'll be rebelling against their parents, which young kids always do in every generation. That's true. That's a that's a very that's a very hopeful prospect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was actually I was talking to my my brother last night. It's just a random connection that popped up into my mind. There, there's some guy on Instagram who's sort of like he sort of sends up Gen Z. Like you can tell he's a young guy. He's got to be in his early twenties. And he, he does these videos where he's like talking about food in the way that Gen Z or influencers kind of talk about food. And it's so funny. I mean, the guy is using, he's using words I haven't even heard before. Like I, I'm a millennial and I guess that means I'm getting old. <laughs> but <laughs> like he's, I, I was, I told my brother, I, I actually think that the sort of like the, there's going to be, there's going to be pushback within every generation as yes. there always is against like a you know, woke nonsense and Gen Z, but also 
also just like you know this weird the sorts of things that john Hite focuses on you know the the these very strange pathologies where people regard victimhood as this badge of honor and where you know the idea the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy is just like inconceivable like expose yourself to something that's unpleasant so you can potentially get around it and, and you know get over it instead of like wallowing in it you know so i actually think that the younger generation people in gen z and then even younger um will they'll they'll just like any generation will produce their own you know they'll produce their own comics and their own like and their own like you know culture warriors this is the younger generation that, by the way matt my yeah. son matthew that's matt hey. johnson <laughs> oh, how's it going yeah matt meet oh, matt. Wow, wow, matt, wow. matt we're all matt over johnson. the place <laughs> yeah Hey, Matt. How's it going? I'd be, I'd be, yeah, if I'm, yeah, if I'm talking to somebody on the street, there's like a forty percent chance that his name is Matt as well. So you know, yeah, we we are, we really are everywhere. But anyway, yeah, just close to close the loop on that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there will be a lot of there will be pushback as there invariably is, and I, people get tired of scolds. They get tired of being yes. told that they can't Amen. say things. Right. Yes, and the you know and the you know victimhood is yes. this beautiful. This beautiful. It's a it's it's a really really unsturdy plinth that people are putting themselves on, and it, it's it's going to collapse, yes. you know, because life is just too relentless, it's too brutal, it's too ironic, uh, to use one of Hitchens's favorite words, you know, it's it just sanctimony. It gets old, man. You don't want to hang out with sanctimony <laughs> people. So anyway, I I hope I hope Gen Z just like starts to yeah starts to come out of it, the fog. So so and I agree totally, which is why I think we have there's great cause for hope, I think, Matt, because of what you just said. Uh, th- things are rarely a straight line forward into the future. Generations cycle. Uh, kids see what their parents do and they want to do the opposites. Grandparents are there to steer the kid grandkids behind the scenes. I think it's a cycle. What do you think, Jen? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think rebellion is always to be expected. And so I've, I've shared that optimism with you. We've written on that as well. I mean, a lot of what we've written on, Matt, is like kind of for the next generation. Like, this is where we are now. Take these lessons. You know, here's where you might be able to improve where we didn't. And I feel like, though, in every generation, there's going to be this band of what Wink and I call dissidents. And I would say you're a dissident, Christopher Hitchens is a dissident, yes. and it's this idea that we're not afraid to think in ways that aren't favorable. And so what I love so much about Christopher Hitchens, and I would like to talk about internationalism because that's where I disagree with him, but where I, what I love so much is he was unafraid. He was unafraid to and change, not only just you know go against the grain, change his mind. And I think that what worries me, and like you said, I think before, Matt, So to echo what you said, I mean, we can sit there and we can blame social media and whatnot. I feel like those are all influences that we didn't see growing up or as not as much. And, and, and we can, I even, you know, less so than you, uh, not being millennials, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, I, I feel like I, I, I worry though, that that idea of being a dissident is getting harder and harder because the forces of conformity are getting greater and greater. And that concerns me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Hitchens actually said, he said that there, he hated how all the terms we have for what could conceivably be called dissent in society are uh, condescending in many cases, mm-hmm. like gadfly, for example, mm-hmm. maverick. And he would always like list these, these terms. And then he would always say like, he feels uncomfortable with with the word uh, dissident just because you know he 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 knew dissidents in Eastern Europe who who were really putting their lives on the line, and it's just like in, yeah I mean I language language it gets reshaped and evolves over time you know and I definitely think that there's an element of cultural dissent that's really important today and like finding the right nomenclature for it is hard you know it's always going to be difficult and I, I I do think that he was yeah he was just this is what made him so attractive to me when I first encountered him as I think I was a freshman in college when I first started reading Hitchens was just a complete, what seems to be a complete lack of concern for what other people thought of him. I mean, it did seem like a a total and perfect indifference. I mean, he would, he would like, 
he was well known for challenging audiences, studio audiences. Like he, he would say something positive about the Iraq war, Bill Maher's audience would boo him and he'd flip him off, you know, and this is the sort of thing he did all the time. You know, and he, at the end of one of his speeches about free speech, he just said like, my own opinion is enough for me. You know, if anyone doesn't like that, they can take a number, get in line, kiss my ass. And he just like always made these points. And yeah, as a, as a, you know, as a 19 year old, 18 year old in college, you know, the, it's an attractive figure. He cut a good figure on the stage. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why he's stuck around so long is because, you know, in terms of his oratory, in terms of just his eloquence, like he's, he's pretty much unmatched, but it was his originality. And, and it was really listening to, this is the, another one of those moments where those anti-imperialists are going to see me as, you know, like a junior Norman Pedoritz or something, but I'm, I mean, hearing this guy talk about something that I had up until that point regarded, I mean, you got U.S. foreign policy to me was was just an imperial machine. I mean, that's that is really what I thought. Um, I I I'd read a lot of Chomsky in high school. I kind of fancy myself a little radical, you know. And hearing Hitchens uh, ex- like talk about these conflicts that we were waging th- then in the middle of in the Middle East and in liberal terms was kind of jarring to me. And it was it was a it was a moment of it was. It, because I, I don't think all those arguments stand up. I think they're very good arguments against the Iraq war. I try to make that clear in the book. But uh, there, there absolutely is a shift. There was something that took place after the Cold War um, in the United States' role in the world and the way it viewed its role in the world that I, I did see Hitchens as right about. And I did think that there was a radical argument that could be made for it. And uh, another author that made it probably at greater length and really talked about the ways in which um, these, this interventionist foreign policy could be considered radical or liberal was Paul Berman. Uh, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but his book, Terror and Liberalism, which came out in 2003, and his, his book that probably influenced me even more is called Power and the Idealists. And he basically talks about these, these anti-totalitarian intellectuals in France in the 70s who kind of saw through communism and then kind of came around to this sort of interventionism that would develop later on. But this is a, this is a niche position. Frankly, I mean, is there, there aren't many people who make the liberal argument for, you know, um, greater U.S. interventionism abroad. And like that's that's just another example of Hitchens just thinking for himself and just, you know, coming to these conclusions uh, independently and, and really, really not caring what his buddies thought. Because, yeah, he, you know, he left the nation for a reason. I mean, he just he ended up being truly hated on huge chunks of the left, genuinely despised. You know, I mean, people call him a sadist and an imperialist and just a, a monster, you know, so it's a lesson for, for all time, I think. Like, it's a gutsy, it's a gutsy way that, that he lived his intellectual life. You, you opened a door that I'm going to walk through briefly, because I think this is the lesser of our conversation, but you opened the door about internationalization. So I'm going to jump in there because this is where I'm at. This is where my mind is at. You know, I've studied internationalization through the eyes of geopolitics, which I think is a very unique way to do it. And in doing so, you know, you, you just said something fundamentally changed after the cold war and something did fundamentally change. I mean, the whole, the, we set up a world that was based on cold world, you know, cold war politics, where the United States was the quote unquote policeman of the world. Trade, free trade happened because we actually had a Navy that allowed it to happen. You know, prior to uh, World War II, before the, the U.S. Navy was at the level that it was, I mean, we had piracy was rampant. And so we, the U.S. made a bargain that they would do these things. They would keep the world safe in order for the U.S. to be able to be in control. Like that was kind of the, that, that was the, the, the deal that was made. But now where most of our trade, the United States, most of our trade, and again, I'm getting a little bit technical here, but this is, this is fast. This is what fascinates me. Most of the U.S.'s trade, ex, uh, you know, external trade, 70% is within NATO. So even though we, you know, China seems so big in our minds, we really don't get all that much from them. Uh, natural resources, more and more the U.S. has been able to get that closer to home or even in home with things like fracking, pipelines and whatnot. So all this, the reasons for U.S. to be who it was in the world, those dynamics have literally changed. It's not just really an ad. It's more than I guess what I'm saying is more than just an attitude shift. I mean, literally dynamics like physical dynamics have changed that have changed the U.S.'s perspective on how they need to interact in the world. 
And so with that said, I'm not sure where I fall on the line of, I mean, for me personally, I love the idea of uh, globalization. I love the idea that we can learn and take and, 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 you know, mix and match these different ideas and cultures and influences. And yet at the same time, sometimes, I mean, there is a part of me and I, so again, I don't know where I land. I'm not making an argument one way or the other, but there is a part of me that now that we don't need some of the stuff that we needed, we don't have to get embroiled in some of the things we don't need to get embroiled in. And so, you know, that's where I'm kind of like, well, I don't mean, I don't know where I land on that. What, what would you think that, um, indulge me, and I know that you would be be guessing, indulge me on that fact, and, and then we can get back to more fun <laughs> nationalist stuff. But I'm really fascinated in, in this idea of internationalization and how different people view it. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, you, you mentioned how, like, the physical character of the international system changed. That was definitely the case at the end of the Cold War, because, I mean, we had a bipolar world, and then it became a unipolar world for a while. I mean, China just wasn't the power that it is now uh, back then. And the United States could be accused of hubris in many ways. I mean, I actually think that the argument against expanding NATO so aggressively is, is on sound footing. I mean, when the Russians sell, tell you over and over and over again, that this is this is the red line that we can't allow you to cross. This will prompt a, a very severe reaction from us. Um, I do think it's true that the NATO expansion has an effect on on Putin's behavior. You know, for example, but the the United States' role in the world has actually become all the more important in recent years, in my opinion. Um, when we fought the wars in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, Hitchens was arguing that. Islamism and jihadism in particular was the sort of like it he, he didn't say it was an existential threat he always said that victory was all but inevitable you know because he, he just believed that theocracy was always bound to fail um you know theocratic empire building was was bound to fail um so he wasn't fatalistic at all about the war but i would say he inflated the threat in many ways and and you have to you have to put a couple things aside when you make that point first you know things could always go differently with something as combustible as, as terrorism. You know, I mean, if a dirty bomb was set off in, in Berlin tomorrow or in New York, you know, suddenly it would rush to the forefront. You know, if an attack like the one that took place in Paris in 2015 took place tomorrow, it would rush to the forefront of our, uh, our collective, you know, our collective vision of the world. Um, so t terrorism is very combustible. Ideas are combustible. Um, the ways in which uh, political Islam has made life miserable for hundreds of millions of people in the world. I mean, just look look at what's happening in Afghanistan right now. I mean, I, I was just listening to a podcast with um, the head of, I think it's Save the Children, the NGO. And for a while there, they could their, their female employees could not operate in the country anymore. The Taliban decided that no female NGO employees could operate in the country anymore. Um, women can't go to school anymore. They can't hold positions as journalists or judges or, you know, it, this is this is a complete nightmare what's happening so i do think when people talk about the threat of these ideas they're often thinking of you know two two buildings that are on fire in downtown new york and they're not thinking about the sheer amount of suffering that this ideology inflicts on people around the world um but in terms of security i, I do think hitchens inflated the threat of terrorism i mean it, it was it was these were liberal these were wars that you could definitely defend on liberal grounds i mean you could defend the afghanistan war on the grounds that one it was a hundred percent justified. I mean, the response to September 11th, I mean, yes, the Taliban was harboring Al-Qaeda. And then once you're involved in that war, you're faced with the central central dilemma, which is, do we leave, do we abandon the country to certain collapse, or do we try to build something of a, a functioning democratic society out of it? You know, it was it was ultimately a, a doomed mission. We, we withdrew 20 years later. You know, I, I understand that a lot of people on the sort of anti-imperialist left take a victory lap about that. But people forget that we only had a couple thousand troops in Afghanistan. Um, that's down from over 100,000 at, at the height of the war. Um, really, I, I think the withdrawal was a big mistake. I really do. Um, and it, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch what's happened to Afghanistan. I mean, there was a pretty low level of investment that was keeping the country afloat. But anyway, um, those wars just weren't, they weren't existential in the same way that a war with China would be existential, or in some senses, you know, the, the war with Russia now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, it's not that we're, we're facing military oblivion in Europe, you know, but there's a nuclear component to the war. There's Putin's sense of what he can get away with in the world. 
Um, there's the, the lessons that Xi Jinping is bound to draw from what Putin thinks he can get away with in the world. And there's the United States role in, in being an anchor of security in Europe. You know, like great power politics is back in such a big way now. I think the United States sort of muscular foreign policy, which Hitchens was always in support of, has become more important in recent years. Uh, there was a period there, you know, when we were fighting the wars in the Middle East. I mean, even during the Balkans, you know, where you could say, OK, well, these are almost like, you know, the most cynical interpretation was, you know, these these wars are, are just to expand our influence, you know, regard heedless of the consequences. But in the Balkans, that doesn't make sense. I mean, the Clinton administration right, had right. to be dragged into that mm-hmm. conflict, had absolutely no desire to be involved. I mean, it spent years mm-hmm. dithering while a lot of people died in Bosnia. So I, I do think that, you know, the, the we still have an important role in the world, the mm-hmm. United States does, and it, it's become more important in recent years. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my general take. I think Hitchens would likely be sympathetic to that idea. I, I highly doubt that he would have seen the invasion of Ukraine and uh, either faced it with indifference or contempt for NATO. I mean, I think he would have seen that as a really incredible, like, uh, backwards attribution of responsibility. Um, and he would have called it masochistic. That was mm. a word he used often when it came to the sort of anti-imperialist left. Mm-hmm. By the way, there's a connection between um, what I just said about uh, foreign policy and the, the domestic issues that we're talking about. And I, I, I like to get Wink's take on this, but, you know, there is this constant desire, and it's something that is really clear in the 1619 Project and a lot of other uh, sort of like radical political projects these days, to run down our own mm-hmm. system, to run down liberal democracy as it exists in the world, to say it's just a legacy right. of colonialism and racism and slavery. And, and that's, that's what pe- I think that that's operating on the hard drive when people say all, the, all America has ever been is an imperial power and it's all will ever be. And I think it's operating on the hard drive when people say, you know, the Constitution was just, a, a, you know, a, a piece of garbage produced by slavers, you know, that just to mask their own hypocrisy. You know, so I, I do think that there's there are these commonalities there, and that cynicism is corrosive to uh, the civic life of a country. I think, but anyway, yeah, I'd like to get you guys to take on that because I feel like that's too much foreign policy stuff. <laughs> well, you know, I, I yeah, um, it's so fascinating to me the the current cynicism in matters involving identity, uh, as referenced in the sixteen nineteen project. Um, because uh, I, I have studied black history probably since I was in junior high school. Uh, as a kid, I would go to the junior high school uh, library and, uh, and read every book I could find on black history. And it's just interesting that in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, um, I would always come away with the impression that blackness equaled enterprise. Uh, I remember my grandmother used to subscribe to Black Enterprise Magazine, which was a magazine published by Earl Graves Sr. in the beginning of 1970. And it was just simply an expose of the accomplishment of Black entrepreneurs, Black businessmen, Black corporate executives. And so in junior high school, I grew up equating Blackness with that, with Black Enterprise, with people like Percy Sutton, a major radio station owner in Manhattan, or John Johnson, the publisher of Ebony Magazine, um, or Earl Graves himself, the publisher of Black Enterprise Magazine, or Reginald Lewis, who became the wealthiest Black American by the 1990s. But my point is, to me, it is so, and I'll use the word bewilderingly, uh, it's disconcerting in a sense, that Blackness today, for the young generation, is conceived as oppression, nothing else matters. Because that's so foreign, so alien to what I knew as a kid growing up in, of all places, Richmond, Virginia in the 1970s. And as you know, of course, Matt, Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. So if there's any place where you would have thought a young kid would have felt, oh my God, the world is oppression, nothing else matters, it would have been me. But it's quite the opposite. I, I, I was instilled and trained to, to view blackness as enterprise and triumph over adversity. Sure, there's adversity in your past, but we study those who triumph because that fortifies the human spirit, which is common to all humans. All of us have a spirit. And I think sometimes that's going to be the downfall 
of dogma, downfall of dogmatists, the downfall of those who support things like critical race theory and 1619 Project is because you can't, you can't imagine a theory and then seek to impose it on reality. It really is the opposite. You know, you look towards reality and then create ideas and policies from there. So I guess my point is, and, and I, 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 I'm, I'm just expressing my frustration that this idea of blackness as oppression is like 180 degrees from what I knew as a little kid in the 1970s in a place where one would have thought that would be how you per, would perceive blackness. What, what are your thoughts on that? How the development of a culture and consciousness can be so at odds with uh, reality? And is that sustainable for generations? I mean, yeah, well, I, I really like that anecdote just because it's like, there, there is this, this weird deflationary aspect to a lot of our cultural conversations now, or political and cultural conversations. Uh, and there, there is, you know, it's one of those things where yeah, to, to, to violate Hitchens' rule, speaking as a straight white male, you know, I, I, I always, I, I do, I do always, I do always try to, you know, I do try to appreciate the fact that, that it's just inconceivable to me to be other than what I am. This actually applies to anybody. I mean, right. Matter exactly. They're, they're and Hitchens would approve right. of that. That's or right. Trans or what is it? <laughs> yeah. It's literally right, inconceivable right. to be, it's inconceivable to, there are a lot of straight white men whose uh, daily experience in the world is polar opposite to mine. It's, you know, if they, they might live in the Carolina Piedmont. They might have a, a parent who, who uh, is addicted to opioids. They might have a, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a completely different world, you know, for other people who just look like me and sound like me, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I do have to say, though, that, you know, I'm not somebody who's ever going to win the victimhood Olympics or the grievance Olympics. Like, I, I just, I've just had a, I've had an easy ride. <laughs> I mean, there's just, there's absolutely no question that I've had a very easy ride. And the one thing I will say that I like about it, the fact that I've been given a lot, a loving family, you know, live in the United States, very powerful country, easy stuff, uh, is the fact that if I do mess up, if I do fail, I, I don't have anybody to blame. I mean, I had every opportunity. And I do think that psychologically, that's valuable. It, it's valuable to be able to say, and I know other people do have a lot of factors outside of their control to blame. Uh, I understand that, but it just, it does, it, it seems sort of, um, it seems sort of, I don't know, like, like, like a rejection of the American idea to constantly be blaming factors outside of your control. I mean, the country is just, it, it's sort of a country founded on self-determination and on, on yes. human autonomy. And self-reliance. Human autonomy. And agency, enterprise. Exactly. And individuality. And self-reliance. Yes. Yeah. And optimism and hope. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, and that's just that's like that's the Bayard Rustin approach to civil yeah. rights and to, to yeah. equality. You know, it's just like he he said what we want to we, we want to do is mainstream education and make sure everybody is getting the, the, the same high quality education so they have equal opportunities. You know, and this is like I, I wrote a piece about uh, Bayard Rustin for Quillette a little while ago, just saying like that there are limits to radical politics and radical protest today. You know, he, one of the things he would frequently say in interviews is the reason why the March on Washington was so successful is because they had a they had a narrow agenda. I mean, mm. They weren't asking white people to confront the racism. They weren't asking for people to save themselves. It, there, it didn't feel like this giant cathedral on the National Mall. It, well, I guess in some sense it kind of did. But he, he said well, they wanted jobs. You know, they, like the, the actual march was the march for jobs and freedom. You know, like they were, they were like demanding concrete political changes, you know, first it was, yeah, first it was, you know, like desegregating the lunch counters and school integration, then it was jobs and, and freedom and actual democracy. And like, that's a, that's a political program. Like that's something people can Matt, get behind. what was the and it's popular just now it's like, word God, in the I Have know, a Dream when John speech. McWhorter, I was, I was originally, what was that? What was the most popular word in the I the Have a Dream word. speech above all else? One word. Was repeated above all else. What was that word? It's a word that Christopher Hitchens would have embraced wholeheartedly. That word was freedom. Freedom. Oh, wow. Repeated 17 freedom, times freedom. in that yeah, speech, right. more than any other word. It wasn't about critical race theory. Oh, absolutely, you would have. You know, and, and Hitchens, Hitchens did try to call attention to, you know, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and the organizers of the 
of the March on Washington. And, and he would, you know, he'd frequently point out that these, these were, these were real liberals. That was, that was his argument about mm-hmm. Rustin. You know, he, he's a, he's a, he's a real liberal because he's just, he, he was a, Rustin was a socialist. Rustin was a radical. You know, he was, he was also a gay man in the United States, a gay black man. I mean, a guy who was, who was actually like, who was persecuted for his race. I mean, you know, one of Martin Luther King's political opponents, you know, said that he was going to spread the slander that Martin Luther King had a relationship with Bayard Rustin if he didn't like move off of this guy's turf, I think in New York. And, and Martin Luther King kind of distanced himself from, from Bayard Rustin after if, what I'm saying is this guy had every reason to be full of grievance and full of, of uh, bitterness. And yet he, he was just, he was just a universalist like through and through. And he's just, and I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to downplay his true radicalism. You know, he, he was certainly cynical about what he described as like New York times liberals and sort of like mainstream white America in many ways. You know, I'm not trying to say that he didn't have his suspicions of people, but I, I don't know. I, that, it's, that's always seemed like a more heroic story to me. I, here's, here's a question. This is a question I would really like to ask both of you. Um, what, what, is, what is the end goal? Like, let's say you're like Hitchens. Let's say a political commentator is like Hitchens, acknowledges the horrors of slavery, calls for reparations. Hitchens called for reparations. You know, he thought that was an important thing to do. Agree with it or not, that's what he thought. Um, so he says all these things. It acknowledges that uh, Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. He wrote a book about Jefferson that really does look at Jefferson with clear eyes, you know. Um, so you acknowledge all of that. And then you say, let's move forward. Let's try to build a better society together. W- what is he missing? What is Christopher Hitchens missing I- I- according to, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones, for example, or according to Robin DiAngelo? Well, what more does he need to do? Is it? Is, is I, I remember when McWhorter's book was coming out. Was it called Woke Racism or... Is, yeah, woke racism. Um, and he was, he's, he's talking about how it was a religion. You know, wokeness is kind of a religion. I remember I was, this was, this was a time when I was really suspicious of the overuse of the word religion because I consider myself irreligious. And I do feel like there's this tendency among people who criticize atheists to say, like, everyone's got a religion. You, everyone's got a religion, you know. In my case, you know, in my case, my religion might be, you know, defending wars of aggression <laughs> if, you're, if you're taking the cynical view but like like but it's this is like something like jordan peterson will say that we're you know we're we're all religiously constituted this was like kind of a, a genre of article that was being published in quillette at the time so i was like suspicious of his argument that like wokeness is a religion i was like is it though what is a religion how are you defining it and then i remember seeing the video of people who were like kneeling like there were all these white people who were like kneeling down in front of their black neighbors, this weird self-flagellating nightmare. And I remember thinking, I think John McWhorter's right. I really do think these people are behaving religiously now. So anyway, I'm sorry. I, I actually really do want an answer to that. What, what, are, what more do they want from a guy like Hitchens, you know, mm-hmm. who's just like, you acknowledge all these systemic factors. Say, let's work toward, yeah. I think this is what Eric Smith talks about as a dignity grab. And I think that we are all, regardless of gender, color, whatever, we all um, have that kind of impetus to, to, to grab at dignity when we feel that it's lost. And this has just become, that's what's become institutionalized. And I think that that is to our, to the detriment of our, of everyone is that's, and and that touches on victimization that we talked about beforehand as well. But uh, I, I I don't, I, I agree all that to say, I agree with Wink that it's like, well, when that didn't work, what you you never get you can never get past it. I remember being in a conversation with a bunch of young kids talking about not reparations, but just talking about race, and and there was this sense that was like, but there will always have been slavery. I'm like, when in a hundred years there will have always been, in a thousand years there will all, you know, like at what point do you say yes, there was always slavery? You know, what do we do from it now? And and I think that that can always be used in a dignity grab uh, to what we've seen clearly lately to, to, to great benefit for people, for, for, in, for, for some people who are using that as a mechanism, as leverage. You know, the thornier issues are issues like affirmative action, in my opinion, just because college admissions is a zero sum game. Mm-hmm. And anytime mm-hmm. you privilege uh, one race over, like you're, you're privileging it over another. And this is why the Harvard scandal, you know, ripped into public view recently. And so I just, I, I always feel like that's just kind of this, recipe for permanent racial strife and animosity when you're like like i mean i i'm perfectly open to the idea that affirmative action was probably necessary at some point 
But I don't know. I mean, will it be necessary in 2050? Will it be necessary in 2075? I right, find right, it right. difficult to believe. I, it seems right. like a very dangerous road to be going down. Right. And then, you know, why uh, is there a comparable uh, affirmative action program for Native Americans? Is there a comparable mm -hmm. uh, affirmative action program for other, you know, Japanese who had family members in turn during World War II? Like, this country has a lot of blood on its hands. And it's, I always feel like that's the antidote to all of this stuff. Instead of trying to wait historical wrongs instead of going through this long and arduous and complex process of figuring out who is owed what all the time it just seems like working towards some some measure of parity is important but yeah there, i know that 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 raises thorny questions and i know that that's like not a straightforward process but my god i mean it does it does seem to like invest in education do do the rustin approach where you mm -hmm. make sure that people in, in just primary and secondary education are getting good schooling like like do but yeah, I know people People also send their kids to schools and certain zip codes and they don't get to go to other zip codes and it's all complex. So Matt, I want to bring, you know, bring the last word back to you and to Hitchens. One of the things that Wink and I, you know, are talking about and, and he gave, a, you know, a very good overview of, you know, highlights that we bring up in, in, in our book and that I think are dissident views, much like what you are dealing with in the idea of Hitchens. What would we come to the conclusion that we're kind of, as Wink alluded to earlier, that we're writing for the next generation, that, you know, this might fall, what we're saying right now might fall on, on deaf ears. And, but we still have hope to bring up the idea of hope again, that, 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 that what we're saying now might have influence into the future. What would you, Matt, and maybe also what would you think, what would Hitchens and your words be for the next generation? How would you close out in the most optimistic way of what, Hitchens can bring what you and Hitchens can bring to us for for words of wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. How can I, I mean? Yeah. There's that. There's that to go to your book, which, by the way, we'll have uh, links to in in this podcast, so that everyone can. Thank you. Yes, and congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, congratulations to you too. Looking forward to the we share a publisher. We do share a publisher, Pitchstone. We'll like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, for, first of all, yeah. The point about like directing it toward the left, the, the that was one cause of of anxiety for me, just because Hitchens really was such a heterodox thinker, and you know he he did he did end his life urging people not to be tribal, not to like he he would say that writers shouldn't even really be members of political parties or factions. Like he's just like you should you should try to be as independent as possible. So you know he sort of did spurn the left in many ways, but. I, I still make my case and he still said some things near the end of his life that suggest he was still on the left. Like he said, he moved toward the anti-totalitarian left. It's actually one of the last things that he wrote. Uh, but anyway, that aside, Hitchens for the next generation. So I actually do think Hitchens is a really wonderful uh, through line into, into politics, history, um, a, a, like culture. A lot of the things that we're talking about because he was so eloquent and he, because he was, he was eloquent in a fun way. I mean, he wasn't stodgy eloquent. You know, he was he he would he would tell audiences to kiss his ass. You know, for example, uh, like he he um, he's just such a brilliant writer, and uh, he's he's such a, a master stylist. You know that I, I think that will and it, his massive trove of content on YouTube is still up there. It's still up there for people to find. Um, so that's that's probably why I was into him to begin with. You know, I just sort of listened to his debates about religion, and I was like, this guy's just he's a different sort of a different sort of presenter and somebody who is just so comfortable with the, the natural organic literary illusion and then somebody who's so, yeah, but then, and then, you know, I, I would just say there's that to kind of get people interested. Um, it, it's something good for, I would say young, young people in college, like freshmen, sophomores in college, like take a look at some of this stuff because you know, you'll learn a lot about writing by reading Hitchens, which is always a valuable skill. And despite the existence of chat GPT, which uh, many of my friends are insistent will displace me as a writer within the next 10 right, years. Right. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think being able to write is still a valuable skill yeah. and probably will be for the, uh, the foreseeable future. So you'll learn a lot about style and, and how to actually conduct yourself in an argument. And then, you know, I, I just, I do think that his, his ultimate uh, commitment to just liberal principles and, and the heterodox positions that that caused him to take yeah. A really important um, lesson for for anyone, any future generation, because I think looking at the world in terms of bedrock principles and values is much 
it's it's going to serve you much better mm-hmm. than looking at the world in terms of a narrow political prism. You know, saying like even saying I'm just an anti-Trumper or even saying I'm just a, I'm a pro-Trumper or like, like looking at things in the political moment, like Hitchens at the end of his book about Orwell said that people who maintain a consistent allegiance to a set of principles Mm -hmm, are the ones mm -hmm. who will endure. And I I do think that the same reasons Mm -hmm. I make this point in the book, the same reasons Hitchens was critical of cold war U S foreign policy are the reasons that he actually supported some elements of that foreign policy later on. It was the internationalism, just the idea that every life has the same value that every that you know that we have a responsibility to protect people who need it around the world. Um, like that's that's a principle that can be applied in ways that seem contradictory, you know, yep. and that cause political problems. But so th- those are the main reasons why I would recommend him to to a young reader, you know. And yeah, he's just he's just a fun read. <laughs> it's just a, just going through his over is just a it's a blast. So it, you know. isn't that crazy that to be a dissident is? I mean, you saying it out loud sounds so crazy, but it's actually. To, to hit yourself to principles and not identities. And when you do, things actually become more Fun. comfortable. Oh. It's easier. It's much easier to navigate yeah. the world, to navigate political debates and discussions yeah. with people. If you, if you know that you, you feel that you know that you have sound principles that are mm-hmm. guiding you, you know, mm-hmm. Um, that you mentioned earlier, just you mentioned globalization, and this, it's it's actually kind of a funny thing. A lot of people on the left don't like the word so much anymore. Mm-hmm. They they view they view globalization as this sort of like engine of capital, and they and they sort of just view it as this this oppressive force, you know, where all these like elites get together at Davos and, mm-hmm. and talk about mm-hmm. how they're gonna or or in Brussels and talk about how they're gonna fleece the poor. You know, it's like it, Hitchens always said it was like he thought it sounded progressive. It's inherently progressive, the idea of free trade, free exchange of, of ideas of workers. And, and that was another way in which, yeah, he was just going against the grain. Mm-hmm. All all of his radical friends said, you know, globalization, I mean, what are you talking about? That's multinational corporations. It's it's that's the IMF. It's this and Hitchens just said, Oh, I like it. I think it's radical, you know? And like that's that's a more it, it just extended directly from those principles, those those universal principles. So yeah, there there are a thousand ways in which that that will steer you in the right direction. Yeah. Less politics, uh, more principles. More princi- ah, I like that. That's it. Less politics, more principles. Oh, I might can I can I can I quote you? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> well, Matt, it has been such a, a pleasure to spend this morning with you. To hearing more about Hitchens and uh, just these uh, these principles in, in general. We're so excited about your book. Again, we will put links to it in the uh, podcast notes, but it's How Hitchens Can Save the Left, Rediscovering Fearless Liberalism in an Age of Counter-Enlightenment. Matt Johnson. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.